Hello, welcome back to Craft Aquatic. I'm Matt G. In this video, I will be showing you my newly built Reef Aquarium Lithium Iron Phosphate Auto Transfer Backup System. <sighs> it's been years in the planning. I finally went ahead and built this thing, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. We'll talk about why I decided to do it and go through all the individual steps in putting together this backup system. At the end, I will install the generator and discuss some of the little details that will allow it to save my behind when there's a power outage. So here we go. Our main reef system sits in the living room in our home. It is this 120 gallon densely populated mixed reef aquarium with a healthy amount of delicate SBS coral. Next to our display tank on this ugly table is the very beginning of a solution to our frequent power outages. We'll come back and discuss this mess a bit later in the video. This blue meringue box is the heart of the system I plan to build. It's a very high quality Ames 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter with a built in auto transfer switch. And here's the battery I'll be using. Lithium iron phosphate is extremely capable, perfect for a system like this. It's exceptionally power dense, very safe, and it can go through thousands of deep discharge cycles with no problem. This is a 100 amp hour battery with a built in battery management system. Here we have this really nice Victron Energy Blue Smart Charger. It's a seven amp version. It won't charge the battery super fast, but it will maintain it for many years with very little fuss. These cables and lugs are two aught in size, written as two slash zero. They are big, and there's a good reason for that. When drawing from a DC source, you want to oversize your cables going from the battery to the inverter to keep them from overheating. I will link to some resources below that will help you figure out what size cable to use if you decide to build a system like this. Also, check out the description below for most of the components I'm using in this video. Following the links will help you out, and it can help the channel out by using those links to purchase some of your hardware. This will be one of the AC outlets for the newly installed Apex. Here, I'm using 12 gauge copper cable with the proper size connectors crimped on securely. It is critical to use properly sized quality cable throughout the build. I was able to save some money here having a few spools of various sizes around the shop. I wanted to thoroughly test the system before building anything. I had a few questions regarding capacity and startup in rush. An inverter can pull a higher amount of amps when starting up than when running. My 100 amp hour batteries BDS needed to be able to handle this inrush without tripping and resetting every time, or that would defeat the purpose of the instant transfer from grid power to battery power. So here I have the battery cabled into the inverter and I'm testing it on our downstairs coral frag system. On this Ames unit, the green light indicates the inverter is in pass through mode, taking power directly from the grid. So I've run this cable to the rack and rubble frag tanks to perform this test. Here I've already marked the outlet for the generator to be plugged into. It's a good idea to mark this plug, especially if you have neighbors coming over to help out in a pinch. If you'd like to see more about the Rack and Rubble Frag system, I've made several videos that I will link to in the description. There are dozens of helpful and entertaining reef aquarium related videos in the Craft Aquatic channel. Please do take the time to subscribe, hit the thumbs up, and check them out too. The inverter, battery, and transfer switch work great on the Rack and Rubble, so here we are upstairs again to test the battery and inverter on our 120 gallon mixed reef. I've set up this multimeter and turned off the Victron charger to keep an eye on the battery while running the tank for several hours. Unfortunately, I do not yet have the amp draw meter set up, so this will be a very rudimentary test, but should give me an idea of how many hours of operation I can expect, and if there are any unforeseen issues that I need to work through in the final design. Here you can see the battery drain over several hours with the entire system running, including an 800 watt heater that was switching on and off throughout the trial. I ran it for six hours and still had plenty of juice left. If I can get up to eight hours, I'll be very happy. Being satisfied enough with those results, I am now ready to begin work on the generator cabinet. I took some time to hash out the design and settled on a cabinet rather than a box that will sit next to the main display. This way I can sort of build and paint it to match and do another cool thing with it that I'll mention at the end of this video. If you watch my other videos, you will know I am a fan of the pocket hole jig for those super tight joints. So I'm using that along with a handheld jigsaw and some one by twos to create a rigid frame. 
This bottom area of the cabinet will be paneled in, housing the battery and components. I've intentionally built the cabinet a little taller and wider than I need to to house a 200 amp hour battery. I'll attach the inverter and most of the hardware from the bottom of the central shelf. It will still give me enough clearance for the taller battery should I decide to use it. The power cabinet is pretty much complete here, just patching up some of the imperfections with wood filler. I did try to keep as many of the screws as possible on the inside of the frame. For me, the upstairs display needs to feel clean and neat, and this cabinet should be no exception. My goal is to build a backup system that doesn't draw needless attention to itself. All these panels you see will hide the electronics inside, but will be easily removable so I can access all four sides of the cabinet. This power cabinet is painted in the same color as the display cabinet upstairs. The trim matches very closely as well. When painting the cabinet, I first coated the middle shelf with a polycrylic, then masked it off so I could paint the rest of it light gray. Kind of my go-to color for most of the reef stands around the house. Before walking you through my wiring, just a little disclaimer here. This is not meant to be an instructional video, but could certainly be used for your reference if that helps you out. There are some incredible resources on YouTube, such as Will Prowse, to name just one. See the links below in the description if you'd like to freshen up on the basics. Again, I'm building the system because I have confidence working with electricity. I have a career that is very signal flow centric and grew up in a home with a skilled electrician as a father. Don't feel like you have to take on a project like this unless you are completely prepared. Here are the two AC and two DC connection points. One AC plug is for the power to the big ground charger and inverter pass through. The other AC plug is for power to the apex controller. The two female barrel connectors are used for power to the DC backup pumps for when the inverter drains the battery lower than 12 volts DC. This is an integrated DC panel that is partially wired in using 12 AWG DC specific silicon wire to make the connection to a central fuse block. You might mount something else in this area, so left it open for now. You can actually use copper speaker wire for low voltage DC connections if you already have it laying around. Right here is the back of the amp draw meter, and this is the remote switch to the Ames inverter. It's handy to have all controls mounted to the front panel. I'll go over them one by one in a little bit. Here you can see the back of the front panel mounted AC plug. The inverter has a built-in breaker, so I was able to split the output and run it to two separate AC plugs. One of the most important bits of hardware on this front panel is the DC breaker switch. This one is rated for 300 amps and is the first stop for the positive pull of the 100 amp hour battery. It's very important to have a switch like this that can cut all DC power from one connection point with as little effort as possible. And here I have a 300 amp fuse that connects directly to the positive pull of our lithium iron phosphate or LIFE PO4 battery. This is here to save the very expensive battery if signals get crossed downstream anywhere. Here are the plates where the battery connects to the inverter. Also positive DC to additional devices connects at this point. Following the 2 watt negative lead takes us to a 300 amp shunt. This is where we can connect the negative side of the DC devices with four AWG cable and lugs. The 2 watt cable comes into the inverter from the battery and the leads from our amp meter to effectively measure battery draw during a power outage. Again, a link to detailed videos below about different sections of the circuit. This is a 60 amp breaker connected to the positive battery lead with that 4 AWG cable. This sits between the battery and fuse block to act as an on off switch for DC devices, as well as protecting all connected components from power surges. Here we have the fuse block itself. Connected to this block are separate fuses for the extra DC output, the two backup pump plugs, power for the two battery meters, and the two USB charge points with built in meter. The inverter is rated for 2000 watts, far above what my system typically draws during a power outage. The surge rating of 4000 watts is for draw during startup, such as a compressor coming on. Pure sine wave is better than square or modified square since it is clean power that will not potentially harm your heaters, pumps, and reef controllers. I needed a way to switch the charger on and off as well as test the inverter and battery once a month. I soldered this three-way power strip directly to the input plug in the side of the power cabinet. The green plug is the original end of this strip, now used for its negative terminal only, in order to ground the inverter itself. Here's everything all wired up. I did my best to make things neat and tidy, just like we say when setting up a reef aquarium, neat equals safe. 
If you're very observant, you'll notice that I applied heat shrink to all the heavy DC cables and finished wiring up the DC pump backup circuit. If you're interested in learning how I shortened and installed lugs on the heavy duty DC cables, I've included a link to a video below. The Chin's 100 amp hour battery fits in here with plenty of room to spare for the two to 300 amp hour battery. I generally need no more than six hours of backup, but I will be installing that 200 amp hour battery just to give my family plenty of capacity to run their devices as well. The 100 amp hour battery will be used to build a second, much simpler system for the downstairs frag tanks. Right here you can see where I mounted that grid kill power switch. I can easily fit my hand in this ventilation gap to switch it on and off. The half panel on the back allows the inverter's fans to evacuate hot air, and the panel on both sides are press fit and easily removable to maintain battery and hardware within. With that said, the system should run for 10 years with little to no maintenance required, though I may want to install a solar charge controller at some point in the future. Here we have the finished front panel, has all the controls I need with nothing I don't. The reason I decided to build a backup system instead of purchasing an EcoFlow or something similar are many, but the fact that I can customize the look, upgrade the components, and increase capacity at will was really the main draw. So we have an additional AC plug for family use, we have the inverter power on-off switch, I'm going to switch the inverter on with this master DC switch. The power meter comes to life. I did run it for a little bit earlier, so you can see there's some information stored on the display. The DC accessory panel has some nice goodies to help out the family during a blackout. As you can see, there's this dual USB charge port with built-in switch and power meter. Moving down the panel is this automobile-style DC power supply. Of course, it is on its own fuse, so it's safe to plug all sorts of DC devices in here. I have a DC bilge pump I used to blast to try this out from all the little nooks and crannies in the tank. This will be perfect for powering that. The nice thing about a panel like this is you can configure and wire it up however you wish. I connected the switch to a secondary power meter so I can keep an eye on the battery. It also serves as a way to turn the DC backup pumps on and off during feeding time. I've had this issue for a while where I can push the delay switch on my reef controller for feeding, but the DC pumps stay on. Now I can just hit the switch and turn them off. Back to the amp meter, I'll hold this button down to zero everything out so I can monitor the battery during its next cycle. There are more sophisticated meters that do that for you, but I like the fact I could see this one from an angle when looking down. So I just powered the inverter on, which is drawing power from the battery and running an oscillating fan. You can see the meter come to life showing that fan is drawing 4.53 watts at 0.34 amps. I can also monitor inverter temperature and keep track of overall amp hour usage. I'm not going to candy coat it. All that planning and work was not nothing, but I am so satisfied with the results. This cabinet is exactly the size and capacity that I needed. It'll be used for many years into the future on whatever system or off-grid home I decide to run. Integrating it into the Apex was very easy. I currently have the Apex set up to switch off lights and AC pumps during a blackout. The battery powers the return pump, heaters, and dosing pumps while the DC outputs keep the MP40QW and the gyre pump running at reduced speed. I found I can run the generator for several hours more using this configuration, while the DC pumps will stay spinning for several more days after the inverter powers down. The peace of mind the system provides was well worth the time and price. As far as the cost, let me put it this way, I've purchased coral that costs more than this entire system cost to implement. It's going to be a lot easier going on a week of vacation now knowing that I don't need to worry about the random windstorms we get in the Hudson Valley. So as far as other things I'd like to do with this cabinet, I've already cut out the top shelf to run plumbing from this shallow aquarium to the 120 gallon reef tank. At this point, I plan on growing a mangrove or two in this little sidecar nano reef aquarium. The middle shelf has enough height to fit a trident and some supplies. Pretty excited to get some auto testing implemented very soon. And here's what the cabinet looks like with the front panel installed. I think it gives it a much stealthier look. So that's pretty much it. We'll end with a fun game. See if you can spot where grid power cuts in the battery generator takes over. I'll switch it on and off two times leading up to the end of the video. The auto transfer inverter tends to be a bit more seamless than some of the all-in-one solar generators you can purchase, which is another reason I went DIY. Please do let me know in the comments below what aspects of this setup you have or might try to implement in your reef aquarium backup system. I feel like there are lots of ideas here that can be parsed out or simply duplicated. Mostly I just hope this video gets your reef keeping mind juices flowing and helps to save a reef aquarium or two. 
As always, thank you for watching Craft Aquatic. Please hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.